I would say this, something that Alfonso said about being shook up with the earthquake this morning. I don't know how houses are built in Guatemala, but in Peru on the western coast, they didn't have rain. And so they would have parapets all the way around the top of the house and the roof, the roof surface wasn't sealed. And a big problem was with people like Alfonso, the place starts shaking. And they say, I'm going to run out of the house. They run out the front door and the parapet falls on them and kills them. So it's kind of a cruel joke there. You can't win. Um, okay, this morning we are starting on a multi-week series called San Pablo. And it deals with some experiences that I had, I'm not going to say how many years ago, but if you want to do the math, 1976. Um, and so I want us to look here, if I can play with the technology. Here is Lima, right here, or I have two views, and the reason for that is this. There's Lima and a jungle town, frontier town at that time was Pucallpa and I have a feeling it's still frontier town. Am I right, Giancarlo? Yes. yes, okay. And not shown is up here is Iquitos, okay? Keep that in mind. Our main focus is is going to be, there, up here again is Pucallpa, but the area we're going to talk about is Nevati, okay? You probably can't see it real well on the screen. This over here is the Ukiali River, and you can see it kind of winds around. Nevati, I can't tell you exactly the name of the river it's on, but there's another river coming down here. And that is what that river looks like. So if you can imagine that you need to travel by canoe and you need to get from up here down to here, you're going to have to go, and I can't even see the path up here, you're going to go like this and eventually get there probably taking at least 10 times the distance, if not more, to get there. And so if canoe is your primary means of transportation, it's going to take a while. And so if we, in order to talk about what we were to progress to San Pablo, we have to do a little bit of history. And this, uh, Anna and Fernando Stahl are famous for their work up around Lake Titicaca. But toward the end of their mission, they went to the jungles and they went to Iquitos, which I showed you up there in the north part. And they, they landed in the jungles somewhere in the 1920s. And this is a typical, this is a picture actually that was taken by Fernando Stahl. And it was after, after cameras are invented, but it was before color was invented, okay? And if we look at that, I want you to notice a couple of things. These, this guy right here, if you can see it, he has a firearm, and I believe this guy right here does. This one here has a bow and arrow, okay? And so they began the work probably up more towards the Quitos, but then as time progressed, it came, it came south. And I actually found 
This is in the archives of the, I guess it's called the Encyclopedia of Adventism. Here is a magazine, magazine, a bulletin from 1953, okay? And as time progresses over the next few weeks, you'll want to keep that date in mind, okay? So, as we look at that, the somewhere between 1920 and 1953, and probably closer to 1953, the Nevati Mission Station was established. And as we'll find out, San Pablo would be in the region of that. So, now, I'll be honest, the pictures you see are representative pictures, okay? So, anyway, so we go to Navati, and we have a story to tell there about a young girl. Her name is Chamayo, I think, and she's about 10 years old. She lived with her father and an older sister, as you'll see later, there's also apparently an elder brother. The father suddenly became ill, and in spite of everything that the witch doctor could do, he passed away, okay? This is kind of uh, insult to a witch doctor. So then, with the with the customs, he took and he needed to find out who was responsible for the father's death. So he, um, he drank a very concentrated liquid tobacco and then went into visions. As he came out of his trance, he announced that it was Chamayo who was responsible for her father's death. And in order to preserve the lives of the rest of the village, she needed to be killed. I mean, this was the reality, okay? And so that afternoon, her older sister grabbed a large stick off the fire and beat her in the head severely. Around that same time, the older brother came home, saw what had happened, and he grabbed his younger sister and took her to the Navati mission. Unfortunately, her, the beatings had been very severe, and she was having convulsions and so forth, and after 10 days of care, she passed away. So this, is, this was the realities of the jungle in the 1950s, okay? Is witchcraft, uh, witch doctors prevailed considerably, okay? But then there is another incident, same time frame, there were a group of uh, individuals uh, who had uh, associated themselves with the mission, okay? And uh, they had built a house near, were in the process of building the house nearby. And as they were coming back up the river, they came by some friends. And I'll put that in quotes. And they say, hey, how you doing? You're building a house? Could you build a house for us? Okay. Nice conversation. And then, when one of them looked around and said, my shirt was over here. It's gone. You, one of you stole it. No, we didn't. Yeah, you did. It was there. It's not there now. Now, 
some of the graces of the gospel had not yet been fully inculcated into the members that were associated with the mission. And so, this back and forth. You took my shirt. No, you didn't. Yeah, you did. It's gone. It was there. And one of them says, We're from the mission. We don't steal. Pop! Well, about that time, a lady came out of the house and said, Here's your shirt. It was laying out there and I was afraid it was going to get wet, so I brought it in. We are, uh, what shall we say, crisis averted. Well, so the mission group goes back to Navati and everything's fine. Except, meanwhile, back at the place along the river, the chief comes home and he hears of this insult to his people and Parish, Parishiko is the chief and when he heard of all this he said we can't have this and so he sent a war party to Navati to deal with the situation so they show up by canoe and as they show up, they step out with their bows and arrows. And they are ready to deal with the situation. So, they come out of their canoes, and I have a helper here who is quite brave. And they accost them, you took our shirt. But there's a problem here. To use a bow and arrow, you need space. And so, I'm probably not the best one to handle this, but in order to draw the bow, you have to step back. The, P, the guys from Nevada are used to bows and arrows, and so what do they do? They keep stepping forward so that the other guys can't draw their bows. Now, if you want to walk down the aisle and let people look at it, you're welcome to. So, what's going to happen? Meanwhile, well, Elder... Elik, Elik, Elik was away from the mission station at that point. So it was just Mrs. Elik who was there. She heard a commotion. For some reason, all of the women in the, vill in the area around the mission were running to the chapel. She went, well, what's going on? And then she sees all this commotion. And so she heads, I mean, you talk about the pluck of some of our forerunners. She starts to head toward where the tumult is. And the other ones say, you're going to get killed if you go over there. And she walks out and walks up to the guys and starts collecting their bows and arrows, just taking them from them. And at, and at that point, Juan Ukiyali shows up. Juan Ukiyali is the very first, my understanding is the very first convert from the jungle region that the Stalls had. And he was translator, and he was at the Navati mission. I actually met him one time. Uh, and none of these pictures have it, but our, at that time our airplane down there was named Juan Ukiyali. Okay? 
But this guy is there and he helps her sort it out and calm things down and eventually they go back to their, their village and she gives, Mrs. Elik gives the bows and arrows back to their owners as they go home. Because the bow and arrow, I don't know if it's still this way because uh, Eric helped me last Saturday night to go through Google Earth. Quite frankly, when I was down there, I never knew where I was, okay? <laughs> but it's on the satellite now, and if you go back to, let's see if I can get there from here. Let's go back to here. All right. Let's not burst any bubbles here, okay? So, the, um, this is actually satellite imagery. This isn't the old thing you had painted on your globe when you were in school. And that dark green is dense jungle. And most of the people, at least at the time I was there, and I'm sure at the time of this story, are what they are, subsistence farmers and fishermen. And... Uh, I would, so their bows and arrows are extremely important to them and this one is a specialized one. You probably can't see it real well but there's a shell on it with holes in it. It's called a whistler. And when out in the jungle if an animal hears a strange noise it freezes. And that's just what this arrow needs. Because as it whistles, the animal freezes and the arrow hits home. Uh, I have also, unfortunately, the number of years that I've had it have not been well to it. This is called a bird knocker. Well, if you send an arrow like this through a small bird, there may not be much left of the bird, you know, I mean, you go after the stray dogs with a bazooka, there's not going to be a whole lot left, okay? So this is designed to knock the bird out of the tree. Um, and this, they, they make another one, which I didn't get, that has three of these arrows on it, and it's for fishing. And they draw back and shoot uh, the fish. So, um, the jungle is very dense and in fact let's see here if I can cycle back through here get there well, another okay if you look behind the house there you can well I got one more to go if you look behind the house you see jungle. The jungle is very dense and later between when I was there and when this story took place they, uh, a gentleman by the name of Clyde Peters came into the jungle and that's when they started the aviation program uh, and Eric brought to my attention a um, your story hour story was was it called Canoes in the Sky. It is highly recommended, but it talks about it talks about the uh, Wycliffe Bible translators. Their base was across the the we called it the lagoon from our air base, and we went back and forth. Very cooperative. And she also talks, it also mentions the town of Atalaya, uh, which was on one of those maps. But, so they started the aviation program, and these guys had to be what I would call somewhat daredevils back then. Now, I flew with Dan Winberg later, and he did some amazing things with the airplane, but... Uh, Clyde Peters, 
I probably got his training in the military. He was single engine, multi-engine, and helicopter pilot. And he also enjoyed the sport of skydiving, parachuting, whatever. And while he was there, again, this, this was the, the, mission, the aviation program started there about 1964, 65, and it was later on in the, um, in the program, he had some renown amongst the Peruvian military as well. And a plane, a passenger plane, had gone down in the jungles. And he, the, the military came to him and says, we know that you jump out of airplanes and we'd like your help. We think we know the region where the plane went down. We would like you to go see if you can find any survivors. He said, okay. So he got a backpack of supplies and he strapped a chainsaw to his leg and he put on his back his uh, parachute and the military flew him over the area of the, the jungle and they said, we think this is the area and they dropped him out of the airplane. His parachute opened, that's a good thing. But the jerk of that opening broke the chainsaw loose from his leg and it went on its own path. And he winds up landing in the tops of the trees and finds his way down to the ground and he thinks he hears voices. So he takes his breath, sets his backpack down and goes toward the voices. When he gets to the voices, he realizes it's a babbling brook that made the noises. The jungle was so dense, he never found his backpack again. Fortunately, he had the survival skills to work his way downstream and uh, live to tell about the experience. So as we head toward the next few weeks, um, you need to understand the Navati and the Navati region, and that was kind of a, a hub for that area. There's another one called Unini, which is all, was also on that map. But I want you to understand the history of the place, and next week we'll start about how we got to San Pablo. Oh, recommended books. Anastal of the Andes and Amazon. There's another one called He Jumped from Clouds, I think it is, or Cloud Jumper. That's about Clyde Peters. Um, and another book that's for a different region is called Jungle Pilot. Uh, and so we'll look forward to seeing you again in, next week.